In this video, I'll discuss rational arguments and moral fallacies. What makes an argument rational is that evidence is provided and the evidence has the right sort of connection to what it is that you're trying to argue for. Here's a standard format for arguments. The premises are statements which are going to be offered as evidence and the conclusion is what it is that, is, that you are trying to argue for. You can have one premise, two premises, or more. Here's an example of a rational argument that is, has moral content. The two premises are that murder is wrong and that eating meat is murder. These are premises because these are given as evidence for the conclusion that eating meat is wrong. Those three dots mean therefore. So again, the way that you'd read this argument is murder is wrong, eating meat is murder, therefore eating meat is wrong. Even if you don't believe that the two premises are true, the structure of this argument, the format, is, is logically good, meaning that this is the right type of argument even if all of the details aren't true. So again, the premise is the evidence and it's in the form of a statement. The conclusion is the result of the argument and it's also in the form of a statement. Two of the most important types of arguments are deductive arguments and inductive arguments. A deductive argument is one where, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is definitely true. Good examples of this are mathematical arguments. Also, some people believe that ethical arguments are also like this. In other words, if you have a good ethical argument, then if the, if the evidence is true, then the conclusion is totally and completely unavoidable. An argument that has the right form is called valid, and one where it's both valid and the premises are true are called sound. So the best sort of deductive argument is a sound argument, one where the premises are true and the form of the argument is good. Inductive arguments are a bit different. In an inductive argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is more likely to be true. In other words, the difference between deductive and inductive arguments is that for deductive, the standard is absolute, whereas for inductive arguments, the standard is just more likely. A common example of inductive argument would be one that's made in science. Science is inductive because there's always the possibility that more evidence will be produced that'll change a theory. An inductive argument that has a good form is called a cogent argument. And if it's both a cogent argument and the premises are true, then it's called a strong argument. So a good example of a deductive argument is math. And a good example of an inductive argument is science. Statistics also counts as a type of inductive argument. When it comes to rational arguments, there are certain mistakes that people make when talking about ethics that are so common that the mistakes have been given a name. These are called fallacies. A fallacy is a bad argument that is made so often that it has been given a name. There are many, many different fallacies, not all of which apply to moral arguments. In this video, I'm just going to talk about ones that are specific to moral arguments. The first is called either the naturalistic fallacy or the moralistic fallacy. This type of bad argument says that what's natural is morally good. The other side of it, the moralistic side, is an argument that said that because something is good, it must be natural. 
here are some examples of this fallacy, of this bad type of argument. Warfare is good because it's instinctive. Vegetarianism is bad because we aren't herbivores. Lions are mercy killers of the sick and weak. Men and women are equal, therefore they have the same capabilities. These are all bad arguments because they argue that because something is natural, it's morally good, or because something is unnatural, it's morally bad. Some of them argue that because something is bad, then it's not natural, or because something is good, it must be natural. The reason that you can tell that this type of argument is bad is because we can think of very clear counterexamples which show that the connection between natural and moral just doesn't make sense. For example, it's not natural to fly around in airplanes or wear clothing. Nonetheless, um, we don't consider these to be morally bad activities. The other side of the issue, which also shows that the connection between nature and morality isn't quite right, is that many behaviors which are really quite natural are considered to be immoral. For example, in nature, animals kill and eat each other, sometimes within their own species. It's generally considered immoral to kill and eat humans. Um, so there's an example of something that's natural, but not moral. Since we can come up with examples of something that's natural, but not moral, and we can come up with examples of something which is, which is moral, but not unnatural, that shows that even though the two sometimes might be connected, the connection between them isn't very strong. The next moral fallacy is called invincible ignorance. This is where someone insists on something being true, even though there's evidence to the contrary. In other words, they're just totally ignoring evidence which would show that they're wrong. Imagine when someone says, I don't care what you say. When they say that, they're indicating that no amount of evidence could ever change their mind. In other words, if they're ignorant, their ignorance is invincible. Nothing can affect it. The third moral fallacy is called provincialism. This is seeing things only through the eyes of one's own community, peers, or otherwise local conditions. An example of this is someone saying, only my religion can explain the state of the world. This is provincial because in general, when someone says this, they haven't bothered actually looking at other religions. So they don't know whether another religion can explain the state of the world. A simple example of this is someone saying that the city that they live in is the best city in the whole world. If they've never lived in another city, how could they possibly know that, especially if they haven't bothered studying other cities? What's happening here is that a person is assuming that since they can't imagine anything better than what they've already experienced, there can't be anything that could possibly be better. This is a bad form of argument. The fourth moral fallacy is called two wrongs make a right. You may have heard this when you were young. The idea that is, it's a bad argument to say that since everybody is doing it, why can't I? Here, the idea is that if something is immoral, if something is bad, the fact that a lot of people are behaving badly doesn't make it morally good. So an another example is, it's not right to give me a speeding ticket, that other car was going faster. Well, if it's morally wrong to endanger people by driving quickly, the fact that someone else was doing it doesn't make it okay for you. The next moral fallacy is called tu quoque. This involves discounting or ignoring what someone is saying because they are a hypocrite. Now, that might sound strange, but the idea here isn't that you're taking the side of a hypocrite. The point of this fallacy 
is that just because someone's a hypocrite, it doesn't mean that their argument is bad. In other words, you have to judge their argument on the basis of the evidence and its connection to the conclusion, not on the fact that the person making the argument is a hypocrite. Um, for example, um, saying, don't tell me what's healthy to eat, you smoke, is an argument which implies that the person who is telling you um, to eat healthy is a hypocrite. Therefore, they can't possibly know what's healthy to eat. Well, that's just false. The fact is, if someone has knowledge or expertise, it doesn't mean that they necessarily apply it to themselves. Consider, for example, a doctor who has unhealthy habits. The fact that they have unhealthy habits doesn't mean that the time they spent studying to be a doctor was for nothing. The sixth moral fallacy is moral legalism. This involves mistaking legal rules or social etiquette for a moral position. The idea here is that the connection between morality and law doesn't always hold. For example, imagine someone saying Martin Luther King's civil disobedience was wrong. After all, it broke the law. That's not a good argument because the law that Martin Luther King was disobedient to was an immoral law. And you can probably think of other examples where the connection between law and morality is broken. For example, jaywalking is illegal, but most people jaywalk when it's convenient to do so and there's no police officer around to give them a ticket. Does that mean that every person who ever jaywalks is morally bad? If you think that a person can be good while jaywalking, then there's a disconnect between law and morality. Another example is speeding while driving. It is against the law to exceed the speed limit. Would you argue that every person who exceeds the speed limit, even when it's safe to do so, is a morally bad person? So there are two examples of behaviors that are moral, but illegal. The other side of this is that there are some behaviors which some people would argue are very immoral, but they're actually entirely legal. For example, cheating on your boyfriend or girlfriend. Most people would argue that cheating on your boyfriend or girlfriend is morally wrong, but there are no laws against it. It is not at all illegal, even though it's immoral. The next moral fallacy is called moral prudentialism. This involves arguing that something is morally right because it is practical or convenient for a specific group or an individual. Even though this might sound a bit like utilitarianism, it's different because it's not taking into account the happiness or suffering of everyone who is affected, just a specific group or an individual. An example of this is I should not have to pay taxes this year. I have to buy gifts for my kids. Even though we might approve of the goal of buying gifts for a person's kids, that doesn't mean that it's a good reason to do something which we'd otherwise consider immoral. In this case, not paying taxes. The idea here is that morality is more important than practicality. In other words, behaving moral sometimes will require a person enduring inconvenience. A very extreme example of this would be in committing crimes against people. Even though it might be convenient to steal from someone else, that wouldn't make it moral. So again, the fact that something is practical or convenient doesn't make it moral. The last moral fallacy that will look at in this video is false moral equivalence. This one involves comparing two things as though they have the same moral implications, as though they're both equally good or bad, especially when the things compared have no relationship to each other. It's like saying X is just as good or bad as Y when the two of them really can't be compared. For example, if someone says a progressive tax is like declaring class warfare, 
This is an exaggeration. Class warfare is a very serious moral wrong where a progressive tax might be good or it might be bad, but it's just not as morally bad. These eight moral fallacies are very common ways in which people make bad arguments about moral issues. Next up are a few examples taken from the internet. Take a look at these and see if you can identify which of the moral fallacies mentioned are involved. It can be more than one. In the first example, uh, someone's taken a quote from Hillary Clinton who said, there's something wrong when CEOs make 300 times more than the typical worker. The comment here is at 25 million, Bill and Hillary Clinton's 2014 income was 500 times the average household income in the US. Can you tell which moral fallacy this is? If you wanna go back and review, pause now and see if you can figure out which of the eight this is. In this case, what's happening is that Hillary Clinton is being accused of being a hypocrite. Whether or not she's a hypocrite, her argument that there's something wrong when CEOs make 300 times more than the typical worker isn't necessarily false. In other words, this is the two quoquet fallacy. The two quoquet fallacy argues that because someone's a hypocrite, they're wrong. That's just not a good argument. Here's another example taken from the comment section of a newspaper. I bet $500 they're lying. I bet it was a liberal who did it. Have you stopped to think why those bombs were only sent to high level Democrats? They're trying to make it look like Donald Trump is encouraging terrorism. What happened here is that uh, someone sent a whole bunch of pipe bombs to some politicians. The politicians they sent it to were all Democrats. This person is arguing that the fact that only Democrats received the bomb is proof that it was meant to make Democrats look good and make their opponents look bad. Which fallacy do you think this is? If you want to go back and review the different moral fallacies, pause now. What's happening here is that the person is taking the evidence and using it as proof that the opposite is true. In other words, they're not putting forward any evidence. They're taking the fact that the evidence is so strong as proof that it can't possibly be true. This is an example of invincible ignorance. Their claim doesn't have evidence. And so what they're doing is they're just totally ignoring the evidence in the opposite direction. This next example is taken from a Facebook post. No country can support a large endless flow of illegals. It just isn't sustainable. Try applying the legal way. If you wanna take a moment to review the moral fallacies, pause now. This comment is an example of moral legalism. Moral legalism is a bad argument because if it's immoral, to deny help to immigrants, to refugees from another country, then the fact that, uh, that letting them into the country is against the law doesn't make it, doesn't make what's moral immoral. In other words, if there's a moral obligation, the fact that the law excuses people from that obligation doesn't take away the moral obligation. In other words, morality is a higher standard than law. Not to say that people should break the law, but just to be aware that where there's a conflict between law and morality, sometimes following the law is an immoral thing to do. Thank you for watching this video.